Okay. There are six sets of PowerPoints in the nervous system. Uh, let's see how quickly we can get them all done and do a little review. Um, not important. Not important. Um, this all has to do with, like, the idea of the nervous system, right? There's all of this stuff going on. How do we respond to it? That's the big picture. The role of the nervous system is to interact with the sensory, so what's going on outside, and the internal um, systems and determine what we need to do. Trends you should notice, as we've evolved, um, our um, nervous system becomes more organized and more linear and has more divisions. Um, increase in ganglia, so increase in nerves. Increase in receptors, so all the different areas of reception. And cephalization, which is brain versus other stuff. Um, why is there an advantage to cephalization? There's like a concentration of those nerves that can direct what's going on. Uh, we obviously have some of the largest brains. We are highly cephalized organisms. Um, there's three steps, sensory input, integration, and output. Um, again, these are the steps. Uh, receptor goes in, hits the, um, the dorsal root, which is right at the vertebrae. Uh, it goes to the brain, determines what we're going to do, and then the ventral root um, activates what's happening. This is called a reflex arc. The neuron, it is the functional unit of the nervous system. It uh, sends information. You know the parts. Dendrites, axon, uh, cell body, and then uh, axon terminals. Neurons are very specialized. There's three types, sensory, inter, and motor. Uh, sensory sense, interneurons do the in-between stuff. Motor neurons make the movement happen. Uh, this is the reflex arc, right? Sensory is the blue, motor is going to be the red, inter will be the green, little green one. Um, if you want to pause and do this, do that. Um, again, uh, when we look at cells, there is obviously a very big difference between a nervous cell and a normal cell. There is a reason for that. They have a specific purpose. Um, it is usually the cell body with the dendrites on it, the axon, and the axon terminal. And then the synapse is the small space between the axon terminals and the dendrites of the next cell. Uh, you should be able to identify this. Um, most neurons have what we call a myelin sheath. So along the axon are these like insulating things that allow the message to move faster. Um, in between each myelin sheath is the nodes of Ranvier, and the myelin is produced by a thing we call a Schwann cell. Um, again, a zoomed in version of that. Uh, the idea of saltatory conduction is that um, basically um, the... Uh, signal transduction, so the movement of a signal, goes through the myelin sheath really fast and it can be skipped uh, over the nodes of Ranvier, basically. And it makes it like hop really fast. Um, moving on. Part two. Um, how does a neuron work? So we've looked big picture, we're now narrowing it down. We're going to look at uh, neuron specifically. You already know the structures. Um, and what we know is that there's this idea of a resting potential. Inside of the neuron and outside of the neuron, there is a charge. And if we look at the very bottom little quarter that my face is kind of covering up, we see that on the outside of the cell it's positive, the inside is negative. And we know that that's established using ions. Sodium is positive, potassium is positive, and so they're all hanging out outside of the cell. Uh, at our resting potential. Um, the action potential is what happens when we start to move those positive um, ions in, and we do, it's called, we call it depolarizing the membrane. Membrane. Uh, basically, the sodium potassium pumps using a little bit of ATP move these in and out, and we end up with the action potential moving down the axon. Um, so we've talked about this is like the action potential, so the, the transmission of a signal. Uh, and so we should know each part. At resting potential, almost all of the channels are closed, um, and so the charges is, are not changing. The red on the left is going to be your 
um, oh, it is here too. Um, the red will be your resting potential. Positive outside, negative inside. So I have a lot of positively charged ions outside. Step two, uh, my voltage-gated Na channels open first, and sodium is going to flow into the cell, starting to make it positive. Um, this is the rising phase, and it's just a very slow increase to start moving positively. Um, part three, uh, we see that in the rising phase, oh, um, mm, and we're back. Um, okay, so um, we have all of our ions rushing in, and during the falling phase, we have the opposite happening again. Um, so part three, all of my ions are now coming in to make the inside of the cell positive, and then once I've reached the top, the falling phase occurs and stuff starts moving um, out or it's not let through anymore. And then um, the undershoot, basically what happens at this point down in number five is that I have so much um, of my positives leaving the center that it gets excessively negative before it kind of balances out. Um, that is called the um, refractory period um, after my action potential because um, my sodium channels are inactive, like they will not open at all, and so I can't have another action potential happen until there is like a rest period, basically. Um, so we know that this happens like on the axon, right? Um, this just kind of goes a little bit more into detail with that. Um, we see that it goes from part to part, right? So action potentials in blue, um, then the green, is it going, is it resetting? Um, and those two things move on, right? So that by the time my, uh, my action potential reaches the third space, that um, red space on the far left is potentially open for another action potential. So I can continually send messages because it works in this unit system. Um, this is the sequence, or if you want to sequence them, um, this is the answer. Uh, if you want to label these, uh, some more questions for you. Um, if you really want to, other things, um, uh, adaptations for the axon, again, uh, evolution always comes into play with uh, this stuff. Um, uh, the speed at which the axon potential moves determines on the diameter. So the bigger, the faster it goes, uh, more myelin sheath makes it go faster. And, um, there are like these very specific cells oligodendrocytes, Schwann cells, they all like help our messages move faster. Those are evolutionary adaptations. Um, part three. Um, at the synapse, so, so all of this has happened. The message has traveled all the way down. Um, you should be able to describe what's happening at each of these parts. And then the impulse reaches the end of the um, axon axon terminal. There's this little space between the axon terminal and the next um, dendrite of the next cell where my electrical signal becomes chemical. Um, it's a tiny, tiny gap and the impulse needs to become chemical so neurotransmitters can move across. Examples of neurotransmitters, acetylcholine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, etc. Um, this image on the far left is a good image. You can see that like the axon terminal basically nestles into the um, the next dendrite surface. It just doesn't touch. And we can see that the tiny little green neurotransmitters are released. Um, how are they released? In the axon terminal, calcium is going to be released into the axon terminal. It causes the vesicles of neurotransmitters to move and fuse to the axon terminal and release into the synapse. Close-up version of this. Um, this is what happens. Um, so what ends up happening is that as the action potential moves, when it releases the end, it triggers the release of calcium. Calcium causes those vesicles to fuse to the membrane and to release the neurotransmitters into what we call the synapse or the synaptic cleft. And the neurotransmitters then bind to the postsynaptic membrane or the dendrite of the next cell. Um, this would be in the dendrite of the next cell, a new receptor. Basically, the neurotransmitter has um, doctor like bound to the receptor, and it's going to cause another thing to happen. 
How do neurotransmitters fuse and release to exocytosis? You should remember this term from when we talked about cell bio, um, when they basically are released. Once they are released, uh, the hormones eventually degrade. They like break apart and they're no longer useful because we don't want a response to last forever. Uh, synapses, and we talked about this a little bit, are a lot of the time where addiction occurs, right? If, if my cells are not responsive to a hormone or a neurotransmitter anymore, I'm going to need more of that thing. Um, there are over 100 neurotransmitters, um, and there you have tons of receptors. These are all the examples of that. Um, a couple examples that you want to kind of keep as back pocket, back pocket stuff, acetylcholine, this has to do with muscle stimulation, uh, memory, and learning. Um, so when I have a uh, synapse and I have the hormone move across, it's either stimulatory, it causes something to happen, or inhibitory, it stops something from happening. This is an uh, example question if you want to. Um, this is just looking at um, a, ax or a, a cell body up close. Um, word four. Uh oh, did more not download? Oh, it did. Okay. Um, so that's like uh the neuron. Now we're gonna look at big picture. Um, my brain, right? That is where the integration occurs. Um, I have gray matter and I have white matter. Gray matter is what we call the cortex. It is where all of the um where all of the processing of information occurs. White matter is really hard to identify. People haven't quite determined what it is yet, uh, but we have a lot of it. It's so, and people assume that it's for like higher level functioning stuff. Um, surrounding my spine and my brain is cerebrospinal fluid. Um, basically, there's a very thin kind of canal around the vertebrae and the brain where this sits. Um, it's filtered from the blood and it provides a cushion, also provides nutrients and waste. It is uh, basically plasma. Um, within our brain, there are different types of cells. Uh, glia have numerous functions. They're not neurons. Um, they basically nourish, support, and regulate neurons. So they're like the stage manager, the stage mom of the performing mom, of the performing kid. Um, they do all the things that need to get done. Uh, when you're an infant, in infant embryonic glia will help the neurons form. Um, astrocytes are glia that you have as adults, and they uh, basically will protect the neurons and things like that. Um, when we look at the uh, sensing, processing, and motor stuff, um, we see that um, there's a lot of divisions that you may want to know. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later if it comes up. Uh, the vertebrae brain is specialized by region, so there's certain regions of the brain that do certain things, um, but that's not always the case. When we are uh, developing as embryos, at first we have not much of a brain. Um, we start out with just basically three parts, forebrain, uh, midbrain, and hindbrain. That eventually will separate into my uh, cerebrum, my occipital lobe, my cerebellum, all of the cortex. Uh, but basically, if we look from left to right on this image, we go from very simple to very complex. Um, these are the main parts that you should know. Uh, so the cerebrum, uh, the diencephalon, which is thalamus, hypothalamus, and epithalamus, midbrain, pons, medulla oblongata, and the cerebellum. You probably want to know that too. This is just a rear view. Um, we're going to pause here, and then the next video, hopefully, we'll be able to finish up what we need to finish up.